Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1963 Italian giallo film, The Girl Who Knew Too Much. And actually, this is considered to be the very first giallo film, which that subgenre started in Italy, so it would stand to say that it is the first Italian giallo film. So Mario Bava did this. I have really been digging some Mario Bava. If you dig Mario Bava as well and you want to see more reviews of his works, I have a whole playlist on my channel for Mario Bava. I also have a whole playlist on my channel for Giallo, which I have a decent amount at this point. So uh, I've been on a Bava and Giallo kick at the same time, basically. So this is a very nice overlap, I will say. So once again, like I said, directed by Mario Bava, uh, who's done other films. These are the bigger ones. Uh, Black Sunday, Black Sabbath, The Whip and the Body, Blood and Black Lace, which is his other Giallo film. Planet of the Vampires, Kill Baby Kill, Five Dolls for an August Moon, which is another giallo of his, Hatchet, sorry, Hatchet for the Honeymoon, which is another giallo of his, Shock, and A Bay of Blood, which is another giallo film of his. All good stuff. This script for this film was written by Baba, as well as Franco Prosperi, who wrote scripts for Born of Unknown Father, The Hired Killer, Kill Me My Love, White Slave, and The Green Inferno. Also, Mino Guarini, who wrote scripts for The Attic, Date for a Murder, and The Third Eye. Uh, Ileana de Sabata, who wrote scripts for The Attic and Nothing Else That's Horror, but a bunch of other stuff, which that's kind of the situation for a lot of these Italian writers. Enzo Corbucci, who wrote scripts for Island Sinner, Goliath and the Vampires, The Man Who Laughs, which I believe is the film that was that the Joker was based off of. Death Walks at Midnight. And Ennio De Concini, who wrote scripts for Appointment for Murder, The Devil is a Woman, The Facts of Murder, Black Sunday, The Attic, I Kill, You Kill, and Devil in the Flesh. Now, this film stars John Saxon, who's been in many, many, many films. People in the horror genre typically know who John Saxon is, and these are some of the films you know him from. Nightmare on Elm Street, Black Christmas, Tenebre, Enter the Dragon, which is not horror, but a lot of people in horror know martial arts too, uh, and The Scorpion with Two Tails, which I do want to see The Scorpion with Two Tails, but I've seen all those other films. Uh, I do like Saxon. Oh, and if you want to see a fun movie with John Saxon in it, that's a terrible movie, but it's really fun. Hellmaster. It might still be on Shudder. I'm not sure, but look for it. Hellmaster, all one word. Um, this film is also known as The Evil Eye. So The Girl Who Knew Too Much is the Italian title for it. The Evil Eye is the U.S. and U.K. release title. So it's on when it's on Shutter. It's called, it says the Evil Eye on Shutter, but it um, when they were about to release it, they said it would it they named it as the Girl Who Knew Too Much. So don't get confused. This was actually Mario Bava's final black and white film. Now I will say that it looks great in black and white. I know there are people who really don't like watching black and white films, but I say there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Clerks was outstanding, black and white. Well, I mean, it doesn't age terribly well. This does. Actually, this film ages better than, than Clerks does, for sure. Uh, especially because of, you know, cinematography. Mario Bava's directing style and cinematography style. His use of light and shadows. I'll talk about all this stuff in a, in a little bit. I really love the way Bava directs and does cinematography. He has such a great look to his films. But anyway, this was his final black and white film. Um... Bava plays the moving eyes in Nora's bedroom, by the way. Early on, when Nora gets to Ethel's place, before Ethel dies, she's setting everything up in her room, and there's that painting on the wall where the eyes are moving. Those are the actual eyes of Mario Bava, which I think is fun. Uh, also, the fact that that particular scene when, when you know the eyes are moving, it's kind of creepy, but at the same time, it's actually more funny. And part of that being that the music that was going on at that time was kind of playful, like kind of upbeat and playful. So that was one of those instances where the music really doesn't form a lot of how you feel about the situation. Had it been playing more kind of like doom inspired or scary music, you probably would have felt more creeped out in that instance or like, oh man, something terrible is going to happen. But, you know, nothing came of it. Um, 
you easily understand the beginning of this that the plane is full of tourists because you know they're going through you know going down the line which i love that camera work of just going down the line and getting kind of the inner monologue of each person as they're kind of whatever they're thinking about you know and and you can tell they're all tourists even before you get to nora the character of nora so it's a good setup so that you're just like, oh, ah, she's there as a tourist as well. She's not from around there. She's there to, you know, take in the sights, be a tourist. And so it, it sets it up to be an even tougher situation for her as a character. So it's a good introduction for her. Uh, also, I was immediately struck by the fact that the film looks so crisp. I think that Kino Lorber did a really, really awesome job with this version of the film really really good kind of makes me want to buy the blu-ray of it I, I may end up doing that when nora reaches her destination and which is ethel's house and meets dr bossy played by john saxon there's a thunderstorm and that just made me remember that bava loves to put thunderstorms in his films especially early on as this foreshadowing of bad things to come uh it happens in I, I won't say every one of his films, but almost every film I've seen of his, there is a thunderstorm, audible and visual. Well, actually, in this one, it wasn't visually. It was just audibly. So, But all the other ones, audibly and visually. If you've seen enough Baba, this has his stylistic calling cards, like I was talking about a little bit ago. Great use of light and shadows. That's one of the things I love about his directing. Smooth, free-moving camera work. Scene movements from one portion of the set to another, and long shots that really open up the scene for characters as well as the audience to kind of look around and take things in. And that's those all those things I just named right there are the things that come together to make me really love the visual style of what Mario Bava did. I, I think he passed away in 1980, I want to say, but it, um, I mean, you can see his influences in film going forward and great influence i mean i think he's kind of in there with like the hitchcock type influences at least visually in my opinion you do see it coming in this that nora will end up having feelings for bossy because when she meets him he's very very charming he's very outgoing to her in particular it seems like he's a little bit interested too so you definitely see that interest level coming and then obviously they forge a relationship uh, although the majority of the time when it's going on, as an audience member, you're kind of like, man, this guy's very suspect. Um, and I'll kind of talk about a few of these suspect moments as I go on. Uh, I wrote down, man, Ethel kicked the bucket kind of fast. I mean, I think she was there for one night. Not even a full night, I think, and Ethel dies. Like, <laughs> that was quick. Poor Ethel. Uh, things went badly for Nora immediately. Ethel dies. She gets mugged. Then she witnesses a murder, and this was all within the first 15 minutes of the film, basically. So it moves kind of fast, and I like that about it. It's only like a little bit past an hour and a half, and it moves. It moves very, very well, which is kind of surprising. It was surprising to me, because I know some of the older films have a tendency to have slower pacing, and this kind of does have a slower pacing, but it's not slow to the point that I would have assumed. So... Yeah, yeah, I mean, it moves, and it's very interesting. It's very intriguing. You can see why after this film, Giallo was pretty popular, at least until, I think, 1974, I think, is when people kind of started giving up on Giallo and were like, all right, we want to move on. Um, Nora is questioned as a reliable narrator when it's kind of supposed that she got drunk and then passed out and she was delusional because she was kind of wrapped up too much in a crime novel, which of all that stuff, I mean, yes, she passed out and yes, she had been reading a crime novel, but she had not been drinking. Although you find out that booze had been poured into her mouth by landini the reporter who was following her around because he saw her pass out and then he went to try and wake her up and was pouring some booze in her mouth so um at first i thought that they were kind of making things up that she was drunk but then when they really um revealed that portion about landini i was like oh so she actually did have alcohol on her breath and that's one of the cool things with this film is and a lot of films like this is you get little pieces of things that end up being explained much later. And you're like, oh, okay, well now that makes sense. 
And I think that's just, you know, that's Giallo in general. And that's one of the reasons I love Giallo so much is because it always makes you look back on the film and really think. And it also makes you want to, you know, watch it again a lot of the times to catch extra stuff. Um, but it, but that moment where she's kind of questioned about, you know, about, you know, you were drunk and it's all these crime novels and stuff. It, it sets it up so the audience isn't 100% sure if she's reliable or not to trust because maybe she's just losing it. It's all in her head. Um, the perspective on the shot from inside the grave going out at Ethel's funeral looks amazing. And that's one of the things is, you know, Baba gets these cool kind of like perspective shots. And that's definitely one of them, not just because it's kind of like straight up, but there's so much, there's so much depth that you can see in that shot. And it, it's just very visually interesting. When Nora meets Laura, rhyming, and goes to her house, everything seems okay until they end up zooming in on the photo on the piano of who looks like the murderer, which we find out ended up being Laura's husband, who was not a murderer, but was trying to get rid of a body um, for Laura because she killed her sister to get the inheritance from her parents. And apparently she was, you know, just from there, had to kill. Obviously, there's something sinister in Laura's husband's study as it's always locked and the music becomes foreboding when the camera focuses on it. Now, we find out later, it's not so much sinister stuff up front. It ends up being sinister in the end. And that's why it's cool that it's locked initially and then we gain access to it at the end of the film with Nora as she gets in there. Some of the stuff from in the house had been moved in there by Laura. Laura's in there. She had killed, well, had stabbed at least her husband who was dying at that point. So I like that because especially when it's introduced about the locked door and they zoom in on it and have some very kind of creepy music to it, you know it's going to be important. You know there's something behind that door that will matter to the film. And it's awesome when they come back to that at the end. And you're just like, ah, let's see what's in there. It's a great mystery. So Nora basically ends up seeing a murderer from a, a murder from 10 years ago. Uh, and that's an interesting concept. Uh, it's a little bit wacky at the same time that she's kind of like reliving this, or like getting a vision basically of this murder. But she didn't actually see the murder is what she ends up finding out. She sees kind of the aftermath after Laura had stabbed her sister and then her husband goes out to get rid of the body, basically. So she only gets a portion of it. For how concerned Nora is that she'll become a victim, she actually sure does seem to spend a lot of time out on the streets in the dark by herself. I just thought that was kind of a funny observation that I had because she voices quite a bit how concerned she is about her own safety. And yet she's just walking at night on the streets with no one around her. And at that point, it seems even more sinister, too, because that's when Landine, Landini is following her. And you as an audience member don't yet know his intentions or his backstory. And, but then when you find that out, you're just like, oh, okay, so she wasn't really in danger at that point, at least not for him, from him. It's funny and smart how Nora puts down all the powder and strings around the house to protect herself at night. It's a little, seems a little crazy and a little bit over the top, so that could play a little bit into the audience thought that maybe she's losing it a bit here. But I also thought it was visually interesting seeing all those strings and how they were put up. And, I mean, it's smart. It's a smart situation because she's very concerned that someone's going to come in at night and try and get to her. You can buy yourself a lot of time by, you know, putting all the strings up, and you can tell the next day by looking to see if there are footprints in the powder. So, pretty cool. I like that idea. It does seem very suspect suspect that Bossy is at the house at night when the policeman ends up showing up. That's not the only time. He's also um, unexplainably there when she's going through that empty apartment and she's hearing... The rec what ends up being a recording, he just like shows up out of nowhere. So he does this a few times, which makes him very, very, very suspect. And obviously that was intentional because it's this misdirection, which Giallo always does, where it's like, look at this person, we're going to make them look like they're a good candidate to be the killer in the end, but really we're hiding you know, who it really is over here. 
nor in the abandoned apartment with the voice speaking to her it makes you think she's potentially losing it yet again uh, until you actually find out that it is a recording and then you're just like, okay. I feel like at that moment it becomes a situation where you're like, you know what, she is a reliable narrator. I don't think she's losing it because why would someone be doing this? This is weird. There's definitely something suspect about that. The misdirect of Bossy coming at Nora on the beach like a killer uh, very aggressively, but he actually ends up kissing her. It's that whole thing where he's just like, I can't help myself, I need to now. And she is viewing it, and the audience is viewing it as he might take some sort of violent action towards her, but he comes in and aggressively kisses her. He's talking about being so attracted that he's making his move, but f watching it now, it just makes him look like weirdly aggressive with his advances. Um, so I understand the intent of it, but it, it didn't age well just because it becomes kind of like disturbing slash funny now, if you know what I mean. Landini's explanation of events and his involvement seems extremely believable when he's able to tell his story in this film. And I think it was very important that um, all of it was laid out in a very believable way because that really does help you clear him. The one thing that's interesting too about Landini in it is, at least this is the way I felt, when you see him, his face for the first time, he actually looks like Laura's husband, but with all the facial hair gone and shorter hair. And you know the hair cut a little bit differently. So initially I thought he is the killer, but he's just kind of, you know, changed his look. And that ends up not being the case. So I, I'm assuming that was an intentional misdirect. If so, very smartly done, because you fooled me. But I don't know if anyone else experienced that. You can make a comment. Bava does a lot of shooting characters through openings and things. I don't know if you noticed that, but it happens a lot in his films. Well, it's one to two times per film, basically. He'll do that. He really likes to do it. You know, a, a few examples on this one. Uh, the When the guy, there's a guy when she's out kind of sightseeing with um, Bossy who looks like he's coming after her. But when you introduce him, he's shooting from between the guy's legs and a little bit behind. And the shot is framing um, Nora, which looks really cool. I love how he does those types of things. And then not long after that, there's also one where it's a shot through a gap in a statue, and it's framing Laura as well. So that's just another thing that Bava does, which very artistic and looks good. I figured Landini wouldn't actually end up be in end up typing in his room when, uh, sh when Nora goes to see him and the guy at the front desk is like, oh, he's just you know, continuously typing. As soon as he said that, I was like, probably not. And especially when you start hearing it, like how fast it is and consistent, I'm like, no way. And then you find out he's dead because it's yet another recording. So in the end, Laura ended up killing her sister for inheritance, and then she had to kill the reporter and her husband because she feared the reporter would end up being onto her, and she feared her husband was going to give her up. So it's not just that she went after her sister for inheritance. They play up the fact that she is out there. Like, she has lost it. She's a killer. So, and then she's talking all about the alphabet murders. And, yeah, it's a good kind of, like, unhinged performance at the end by that character. I get the point of Nora's non-reaction to the shooting at the very end of this film when they're on that, like, gondola-esque type thing uh but it's just kind of weird and it makes her seem a little bit out there because that's not a normal reaction to someone shooting a gun multiple times near you and she just is way too calm for that but i guess maybe it's just because she's just been through so much she can't even at this point i don't know that's just a supposition i'm making um, okay, so final things to say about this. Once again, it looks great. It looks so crisp. Kino Lorber did such a good job with this version of it. It's got all of the Bava calling cards, like I talked about, which look great. Visually awesome. Good story. This is a fun time. A lot of the score is very, very playful. I know I, know I already commented on that a, bit, a little bit, but it kind of goes throughout. Changes appropriately, though, where it needs to. I would think that Baba going from black and white to color film probably created a bit of challenge for maintaining 
his excellent use of light and shadows. Uh, I just feel like it's much easier to kind of have the play of light and shadows when it's black and white versus when it's in color. So it was just interesting for me to see his final black and white film and see, um, you know, make that comparison of his use of light and shadows in that style of film with his use of light and shadows in all the color films of his that I've seen. And it that just got me thinking that I was just like, you know, this was probably a kind of hard transition to kind of maintain that that signature style um, moving to, to color. So interesting. So anyway, I would love to hear what people have to say about this film, what your opinions are on it. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Are you in between whatever? Put some comments down there and we'll talk about it. So I'm going to have to give this a rating out of five stars with half stars in play. Oh man, this is good. Um, I think mm, I'm between a four and a four and a half, to be honest. I think I'm going to go the four and a half. And it's going to get the bump up to the four and a half because of how good the style is. And it gets a little bit more of a bump, I think, because it is the first Giallo film. It did kind of start a craze, which I love this subgenre. So there's a little bit of respect there from me personally. So I'm giving it a four and a half stars. Um, but let me know what you would give it. Like I said, let's talk. Anyway, do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button if you can for me. And you can. It's literally just a click just a click um, and it costs you nothing because I, I'm just doing this for free trying to build a community so please throw me that bone I would appreciate that also just hit the uh, notification bell button because then that way you know whenever I'm putting up new reviews or unboxings or any of the other stuff I do because um, if you can watch the videos relatively soon after it, they come out it helps gain traction on YouTube and I appreciate that too but regardless I thank you for taking your time to watch this and until next time Keep it brutal.